Let's talk about something important. Let's talk about something that matters. Let's not talk about trivial things. Let's learn something today that you didn't know yesterday. I'm gonna teach you something today that you did not know yesterday. Today you're gonna to learn something that you didn't know yesterday. Today we're gonna to go down the ride of exactly how we got here. How we got to here. I'm gonna take you down a ride. It's gonna take about five minutes. How are you guys doing? How's everybody doing? Happy Friday night. It is my birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm looking forward to that day. So do me a favor, you guys drop down in the comment section right here. Where are you guys at right now? Where are you guys at? Can you tell me where you are? Florida, California, Tennessee? Where are you guys at? Where is everybody? I'm gonna take you guys down a ride. This is gonna be awesome. I've already laid it out. I laid out some new stuff on the board today to take you guys down a ride so you guys can find out exactly how we got to where we are now. Thank you, I appreciate that. Georgia, how you guys doing, Georgia? How you guys doing? How's everybody doing today? How is it, New York City? First time here or regular? Are you a first time here or are you a regular? I, I teach class all the time. Are you a first time here or are you a regular? First or regular? Just put down there for me, first or regular? If you're a second, you're pretty much a regular because we're just gonna keep building our relationship. First, first, first time, first time, first time. What's going on? How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing today? How's everybody doing today? So I'm just gonna take you guys down a ride. Uh, my name is Chili DeCastro. I teach what your rights are and how we've lost our rights by an unelected Supreme Court. Second time, how you guys doing? Regular, nice to see you. Kaylin, how are you? I'm gonna take you guys down a ride. I haven't taken anybody. If anybody's a regular, this will be a little bit fun because I haven't, I haven't given this particular sequence before. So, you know, when you take a look at this gigantuous prison system, when you take a look at it, when you're like, oh my God, you're like, how did we get here? You look at it and you're just like, oh my dear God, how did we get to this kind of prison system? What in the world happened, right? So that's what I have done. I've traced back through the Supreme Court uh, holdings how we got to this gigantuous, disgusting prison system. And I'm gonna show you exactly, specifically right now, the exact process and the laws. And if you've been here the last couple days, I've really gone down the road with Harry Anslinger and Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller, and I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna to take you guys down the road of the laws, the road of the laws that were passed that create this prison system police state that we all live in today. If you guys are here, do me a favor, take your finger right there and just double tap on your screen for me. Just double tap on your screen for me. Get a couple more people in here and then I'm just gonna begin. I'm gonna begin, I'm recording this myself, so I'm gonna begin as soon as we're done here. Just take your finger, with uh, 300 people in here, we should be able to tap and get 3,000 likes, just like that, it doesn't cost you anything, it's free, it's free. This lesson right here is totally free, this lesson doesn't cost you anything. So just take your finger right there and just tap, 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 tappy. A little tap, 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 tappy. Don't we all wish? So now remember, if I get off course, if I get off course at all, I want you guys to say, just go back to the prison system, okay? Just go back to the prison system. You ready? Okay. So. Now, we're just talking about prison, guys. We're not talking about anything else. How do people go to prison in the United States of America? That's all I'm gonna talk about on this particular lesson. Go to deletelaws.com, get my book, get a copy of this wall graphic, here we go. So, here's where it really, really begins, where the prison system actually begins. Now, of course, in 1865, when the 13 men abolishes slavery, officially abolishes slavery, even though it really doesn't, then the prison systems begin all through the South. They start to get prison systems, but the truth is, just so you guys know, there's not a lot of prisons built. Because back here in 1865, if you got rearrested, rearrested, <laughs> then you just went back to the plantation. You just went back to the farm, you went back to the house, depending on what kind of labor you did, but you didn't go to a prison system because you can check the, the Department of Justice. This is the prison system down here, it's getting blotted out by the sun, but there's no prison, there's nobody in prison. So then, so now uh, the lynchings happen, but that's not part of the, I mean, that is part of the law force, law enforcement, but it's not part of the prison system now, is it? Okay, so, so now right here, this is the first time we're gonna create an industrial prison system in America. This is the first time we're gonna have an industrial prison system in America. And you know why, right? 
Because the Italians and the Irish, the first and second generation Italian and Irish, they're the ones running the alcohol with the cops right here, 1920 to 1933. So, but you know, we don't lynch and kill Italians and Irish, all right? We throw them in a paddy wagon. The term paddy wagon comes from drunk Irish that they would arrest in the groves. And it's, a, it's actually a racial slur against Irish people. So be careful if you say paddy wagon in front of an Irish person. They might just jump up on you now. Okay, so now right here. So this is going to create the first, the very first prison system. There's no system before this. This is where they're going to have a system of prison developed because they can't lynch the Italians and the Irish. And they're not going to lynch the police. The Wickersham Commission is all about the police being lawless in alcoholism, alcohol dealing, alcohol muscling, alcohol organizing. <laughs> right? So here's the system, okay? So it begins here. Now, we've talked about this before. This is going to be the only repeat if you've been here the last couple days. The, the exigent circumstances clause from Carroll versus United States. Again, remember, this case is based off prohibition. 1920 to 1933 is prohibition. The Carroll case, Carroll versus United States, creates the exigent circumstances clause, saying that if the police, number one, if there's gonna be a loss of life, number two, if the cops are in hot pursuit, number three, they need to seize the evidence. In other words, you can't dump out the bottle of alcohol in the grass before the cops get there. But that exigent circumstances clause is gonna bite us in the ass to this day right now. It's exigent. We have to break into your car. We have to break into your house. So the exigent circumstances, Carol, this is gonna open wide the police state. This is gonna open the police state wide. You can't drive down the road today and not have your car searched, period. Period, no matter. The, Izzo, I just did an interview with Izzo, it's on my, my YouTube page. He'll tell you, if they wanna search your car, they will, using the exigent circumstances clause. Created when? Over prohibition in 1925. Is the exigent circumstances clause used today? Yes, what's it called? It's called the automobile exception rule in policing. Look it up. And it's based on exigent circumstances that there could be a loss of life if you drive away or there could be a loss of a seizing of evidence and you could destroy the evidence. This is the loss of liberty for all of us. Really, I'm being honest. 1925, Carroll versus United States, based out of Oklahoma. So, now, you guys go to my YouTube page, deletelaws.com, and watch the videos on my YouTube page. Delete and Laws, go to my YouTube page and watch them. You're gonna learn a lot of stuff. So, now, right here, in 1934, in 1934, Harry Anslinger is going to create legislation that makes it so that if you don't get a prescription from a doctor to get opioids or to get marijuana, that you can be charged with a crime. And if a doctor issues you opioids or if, if the doctor issues you marijuana, the doctor can be charged with a crime. So what they've done is a double-edged sword here to make sure that marijuana cannot spread through the medical community. And then they're gonna take that a step further in 1937 with the Marijuana Tax Act, where they're not gonna issue marijuana tax licenses to any doctors. So the Harrison Act of 1914 is gonna say the act, this is the first act where you have to get your opioids from a doctor, 1914 Harrison Act. Of course, that's based on standard oil breakup, but I'm just talking about the penal system. This is where a bunch of rich white guys ran the legislature to penalize, uh, to criminalize cannabis because they didn't want to compete with the hemp industry. Straight up, that's the beginning of the penal system based on hemp. Because, and this happens when? Before prohibition, before alcohol is criminalized. So now here, so the 1934 Uniform Narcotics Act, that is just gonna be enforcement for the Harrison Act. They're gonna, they're gonna do enforcement against doctors if they issue marijuana and against people. And what's that punishment gonna be? You go to jail. So now 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, this is where the real FU begins for you and me. So this is all based on big money. Harry Anslinger, who marries this guy's daughter, his name is Andrew Mellon, Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon, he's the guy that writes and signs the Marijuana Tax Act. Andrew Mellon is the Secretary of Treasure for FDR, but he was also the Secretary of Treasure for Herbert Hoover and for Calvin Coolidge. 
two administrations previously. And so what was he doing the entire time in those two administrations previously? He was trying to make sure that hemp wouldn't be able to be a product in the United States of America because he had invested in Lamont DuPont and William Randolph Hearst. Energy, wood, pharmaceuticals. So the 1934 Uniform Narcotics Act is really about making sure marijuana can't spread. The 37 Marijuana Tax Act is about making sure cannabis, that hemp can't spread. And then right here, here's the real cliffhanger. And I tell, I've, I've told this story the last four or five days. Andrew Mellon is gonna die. He dies after, right after he passes the Marijuana Tax Act. When he dies, who becomes heir to his throne? Harry Anslinger. What's Harry Anslinger the head of? The Federal Narcotics Agency. So what's Harry Anslinger gonna do? His singular focused mission now is gonna be to make sure he criminalizes drugs cannabis so that it doesn't compete with what his fossil fuel industry with William Randolph Hearst and his pharmaceutical industry with Lamont DuPont. This is just a fact. This is just a fact. Here's the link to standard oil and the penal system that we live in within today. So now as we move forward here, Harry, remember marijuana is popular, man. I just smoked some. I feel great, right? So, so marijuana is popular in the thirties and forties. Marijuana is as popular then as it is now. The same amount of different races, black, white, red, Asian, blue, yellow, whatever color, you think there's a color of a human being, all like marijuana the same. We all do. So now right here, because people are still smoking marijuana, they're gonna pass the 1952 Boggs Act. Now the Boggs Act is a very specific, I mean the Boggs Act is so specific oriented. And what it does is it says that if you get caught with marijuana, two to 10 year prison sentence, two to 10 years upon you having grass, a joint, a seed, you name it, you are done, my friend. And by the way, Harry was, Harry Anslinger, I apologize. I, I, I got a picture of Harry up. I got two or three pictures of him up on the wall because all throughout the history of time, you always have to ask your thing, yourself one thing, where is Harry Anslinger? What is he doing to disrupt America for his capitalist gains and for his racist ideology? Where is Harry Anslinger? So, in 1961, Harry Anslinger's in Manhattan. In 1961, Harry Anslinger calls every single country in the world. And by the way, Harry, Harry, Harry cut his teeth with the League of Nations at The Hague, where he was a war hero, where he went undercover as a German uh, uh, operative, but he was an American spy. Harry Anslinger was off the charts smart. Born poor, <laughs> born poor. So when he gets the heir to Andrew Mellon's throne, oh man, oh man, I can pass laws? Yes, I can. So the Boggs Act makes it two to 10 years, but Harry's not done. He invites everybody in Manhattan. He calls, he calls up his friends at the World Health Organization and he goes, hey man, you guys remember me from The Hague? And they're like, dude, we partied so hard, man. Smoked so much weed. <laughs> and Harry's like, I remember that. And then, and then the World Health Organization, they get flown into New York. Thailand gets flying into New York. France. Every country in the world that has an industrialized way to produce energy gets flown into Manhattan. Harry Anslinger gives them a, a, a debit card, a, 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 whatever, a government card, and gets them a room with the Waldorf Astoria. And then they vote on whether or not marijuana is the demon drug, and they go, yes, it is. So then now right here, now, they, now internationally marijuana is criminalized cannabis. We changed the name so that it says Mahaken, like Mahaken, but Mahawana. So now, but this is where we create a police state for you and me. This is where, let me get some more. This is where we, this is where we, you and I now live in a total police state because of the World Health Organization and because of the Food and Drug Administration. Both of those organizations weighed in heavily that marijuana was the devil drug and it would turn you into a ravaged ax murderer. That was a movie they made. But you remember what I said earlier People, are you still here? Are the people still here? I, I, I can't look at the screen because if I get distracted, then I'll lose my train of thought. So if you're still here, just tap on your screen for me. Just tap on your screen. 
Tap on your screen for me. Just because I can see the likes, I just look up at the likes, just, just tap on the screen. You guys are still in the room, just tap, tap, tap. Because I'm gonna tie it together for you now from the 1925 Carroll case with the exigent circumstances that's now gonna create a full-on police state here in the United States of America. And we are going to lead the charge internationally to training police in exactly how to battle this new front uh, war on drugs. And we're gonna be the ones who not only manufacture the drugs, we create the drugs, we distribute the drugs, the United States government. So now I'm gonna tie it all together for you guys. This is where, this should, it, it makes me mad every time, so I'll try not to get pissed off. But it's damn near impossible. When you actually know what happened, it's damn near impossible not to get mad when you hear what your mouth say. Where are you guys from? Where are you guys at? Where's everybody at? Where's everybody at? Anybody from LA? Anybody live in LA? I'm looking for a couple of assistants to come in and here in LA. I gotta transfer my wall. I need a couple of assistants here in Los Angeles if you're a diehard and you wanna jump in. And now I'm gonna tie it together for you guys so that, okay? So, now you guys remember what I said earlier, right? Were you guys here earlier? Were you here earlier? Put yes I was or no I was not. So you guys remember what I said earlier. If you were here earlier, what I said was, in 1925 in Carroll versus United States, the exigent circumstances clause was created, the emergency clause, that circumvents your rights, circumvents your freedoms, in the name of loss of life if the police are in hot pursuit of you or to seize evidence before it could be destroyed, based on alcohol, the laws based on alcohol. This is based on alcohol. Now, this alcohol is now available on every corner in America, but the exigent circumstances clause still exists. They're gonna, the exigent circumstances clause in 1925 is gonna be for your car. And remember, remember those three are because I'm gonna tie everything together right now. So now we went to the, we, we were all in Manhattan, right? At the single convention where Harry Anzinger got the, got, got the World Health Organization and the FDA to say that marijuana is the devil drug. So now right here, what's gonna happen is because it's been deemed all those, all those bullshit propaganda movies in the 30s and 40s, all of those bullshit movies, because the World Health Organization has weighed in and said, yeah, that, that's right. Marijuana, it, it, it turns you into comatose, right? Whatever, whatever BS lies they made up. Right here though, now in law enforcement, marijuana becomes an exigent circumstance. Meaning, if it's an exigent circumstances, your rights can be circumvented. And so, in the case of Kerr versus California, this is a right out of common law versus procedural law. And I can, I can go into it if you guys want, but in Kerr versus California, the cops just go into the Kerr's house. They just go on in. They go get a key from the manager and just walk into the house. Well, my friends, that just, cops just walking into your house because they're suspicious that maybe you might have a drug. That's the right of the people to be secure in their person's houses. Papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. That's what that says right there. The right of the people to be secure in their houses. But the, the supreme tyranny, the, the unelected group of, of, of Protestant white males, they, they voted that it was an exigent circumstance and the police could enter into the Kerr's house without a warrant with a simple knock and announcement, and then they could walk into their house. That's based on common law. Common law, it goes before our Bill of Rights. It goes before, meaning that Kerr is unconstitutional. Kerr is unconstitutional because the Bill of Rights, this Bill of Rights here, it's protected by the Supremacy Clause that says nothing can go above it and nothing can go before it. My right to be secure in my home, the Fourth Amendment, the one I just showed you on the big board, it's right there, that's the Fourth Amendment, that's just spread out over there. I have a right to be secure in my home against unreasonable searches and seizures, whether I have marijuana or not, whether I'm a crack dealer or not. The cops don't need to kick down my door, the drug epidemic's not gonna get any better. You're gonna ruin families' lives and ruin our culture. Oh my God, it comes full circle, doesn't it? And there it is, friends, and there it is. The moment that Kerr is passed and allowed and your rights are based on a cop's knock and announcement of walking into your home, you are no longer free. Your freedoms are gone. 
You have entered a police state. And now you have a choice when you get pulled over by the police. You can either comply, and if he likes you, then you won't start your criminal justice career because you're not going to win in court. Unless you have money and you can hire a lawyer. And then if you don't want to comply because you don't want to go to the dungeon, let me introduce you to some people you might know. Maybe you've heard of these people. I can list them, but I'm, I'm already fired up. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm about to make one more revolution around the sun tomorrow. It's going to be my birthday. And I don't want to get mad tonight. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into them. But I am going to tell you for a fact. When the exigent circumstance clause is used here in Kerr versus California, and you give police massive powers to, be, to, to, to use the exigent circumstances clause, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? In that same year, in that exact same year that the Supreme Court ruled that the cops can just knock on your door, announce and come running in if there's an exigent circumstance, John Terry was standing on the boulevard, Euclid Boulevard, in downtown Cleveland. Busiest street there is in Cleveland. It was like Broadway in New York City. And Martin McFadden, police officer, ran over and grabbed him. You know what he said? You know what Martin McFadden said? He didn't like how they looked, and he was sure they were about to stick the joint up. So how come he can run over and grab him when you're supposed to be securing your person? Because it was an exigent circumstance. Martin McFadden claimed that he was sure John Terry was about to go do a stick-up. He was sure of it. He was positive John Terry was going to do a stick-up. They were all milling around, walking up and down the street, talking back and forth, and then they stationed themselves there. You should hear this racist Supreme Court case. And it's the worst thing I've ever heard as far as racism goes. And so when, when Martin McFadden runs up and grabs John Terry, I just showed you that Fourth Amendment. That's what the whole thing's based on. That's what Terry v. Ohio is. That's why I'm wearing this t-shirt. This is Overturn Terry, that you can no longer get on my website because I can't ship t-shirts and, and do everything I'm doing. So t-shirts will be available at a specific date and time later in the future. But for now, I'm gonna stay focused on teaching as much as I can. This guy right here, cop, runs up and grabs him, okay? You're standing on the street, just imagine that. You're standing on the street, cop runs up and grabs you. You got a knife on you or a gun on you, boom, you're going to jail. The Fourth Amendment says that you have a right, the right of the people to be secure in their person. That's it. Stop. That's the Terry v. Ohio case right there. Do you have the right to stand there, be secure in your person without a cop running up and saying, I'm suspicious of you. I'm going to grab you. No, you don't. You don't. He said he was sure he was about to go do a stick up. He was sure of it. He swears. He swears. He promises that's what he thought. The Supreme Court then creates new rules for officer engagement with citizens nationally for all of us, for you and me forever. Since 1968, Terry v. Ohio replaces the Fourth Amendment, replaces it. Officer safety is more important than everything else. That's why you hear cops always say officer safety. Because the Supreme Court ruling used the term, the Supreme Court holding used the term that officer safety was more important than your civil liberty to stand there and be free in your person. If the cops thought maybe you were about to shoot somebody and he can conjure that up in his head, then it's true. If you have a gun on you, then it's certainly true. You were about to go ballistic. He saved the day. Martin McFadden saved the day. He saved the day. What was going on in the 1960s? How come, how come a black guy would carry a gun around in the 1960s? How come? Why would he? Sanctioned murder? Sanctioned murder? Is that what it was? Sanctioned? By who? Who, 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 did, the, who did the killing? Who killed Jimmy Lee Jackson? A cop. Who killed Lewis Allen? A politician in broad daylight. Who killed Emmett Till? The sheriff. Who killed Lemuel Penn? Who killed Lemuel Penn? He was pulled over and then he died. He got pulled over. Who pulled him over? I don't know. Who, who killed James Cheney? Who killed James Cheney? Who was it? The state patrol pulled him over. Last time they heard from James Cheney, he died after that. They never heard from him again. They found him in a swamp, him and two other boys. Who killed him? Louisiana State Patrooper. We don't know who it was. 
Mississippi, I'm sorry. I can't keep track of all the death. I don't know why. Why in the world John Terry would have a gun on him in 1963 for the life of me? I just can't figure it. I can't even, wait a minute. So wait a minute, hold on. 1963, is that the year? Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Why would a black guy carry around a gun when he knows black guys aren't allowed to carry around guns? He knows better. Why would he do that? Well, 1963, I can go down the list, right? See all this lynching chart right here? See the giant lynching chart? And then you see this massacre, the Colfax massacre, and then you see the Louisiana Parish massacre where a thousand people were lynched over nine months, right? All these massacres. And then you go through here and I show you these people, Emmett Till, he gets killed. And then I show you uh, 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 Jimmy Lee, he gets killed. And then I show you uh, uh, T.C. Donald, he lived. And then I, I show you uh, Medgar Evers and he gets killed, right? Did, did, did any of those people, were any of the people who were murdered, were their cases ever prosecuted? Were their cases ever prosecuted? Were any, any, was a single person who had, was a person of color before 1963 when Martin McFadden grabbed John Terry, was a single one of them ever prosecuted, ever? No. But John Terry, he could go to jail for carrying a gun downtown Euclid Avenue. Black people aren't allowed to hang around downtown Euclid Avenue. You know that. Don't be hanging around down here. Black codes were just removed just six, seven years previous. But the black codes didn't remove before the early 60s. He wasn't supposed to be milling around downtown. He knows that. So, of course, Martin McFadden looks at him and goes, what's this black guy doing down here? I'm going to grab him and he's got a gun on him. No black person had ever seen their case prosecuted when they saw their brother, cousin, best friend, lover, sister, mother, any of them killed. There's 4,000 lynchings on my wall. 4,000. More than that. More than 4,000. None of them ever, ever, ever. I got, let me, I'm sorry. Let me, let me come. Why would John Terry have a gun? How come? John Terry, 1963, I think he was in his 20s then, so he's born 40. Let's say John Terry's born 40. Okay. Let's just, let's just say around right here, beginning of World War II here, right? So what had happened so far in America when John Terry's born? What, what is John Terry born into? First, he's born into the war, World War II. This is what John Terry's born into. Why would he be carrying a gun? Of course, he was about to pull a stick up. Of course he was going to do a stick up. So, so then you, you cruise down here, 42. And then 1954, for the first time, John Terry can go into town with his parents. He's born, he, so now he's just a teenager. John Terry's a teenager in 54. But now he can go into town during the day. What? Yes. In 1954, for the first time in John Terry's young life, they can go into town after dark. What? Yes. Yes, but then when he goes into town in 1954, 1955, when he sees on TV in 1956, 1957, when he sees the dogs attacking people with the police on the other side, when he sees the Freedom Riders go into the white only restroom and then get arrested and go to jail, when he sees that people are still being lynched and typically first they go to the jail and then the jailer hands them to the lynchman, I don't know why John Terry would carry a gun. It's against the law. I can't imagine why he would do that. Can you? But if you go on to my comment section on my, on my videos, you'll hear people go, oh, he was about to stick a place up. You gotta buy that, my friends. You gotta buy that. Okay, so what does Terry do now? I said I was gonna stay pretty focused on just the police state. So specifically what, what Terry v. Ohio does now, because Martin McFadden, the court recognizes, the court recognizes, Martin McFadden is a hero. He prevented an armed stick up. The, ex the exigent circumstances clause of a loss of life being the first one, Martin McFadden is a great big hero. As a matter of fact, all cops are, all cops are heroes. So you know what we're gonna do? All cops can just look at you and say, if you got a gun on you, they're going to grab you and see if you got that gun. They're going to grab you. At first, it starts off a light frisk. That changes quickly, doesn't it? So now what happens here is cops have the rights to walk up and grab you to see if you have a gun. 
That's the big jump. Before Terry, cops couldn't grab you unless you were breaking the law. Unless you're like beating someone or you're running from a, the alarms going off at a store. And, you know, unless you're breaking the law before Terry, cops couldn't touch you. They couldn't put their hands on you. Of course, because you have a right to be free in your person. We have a Fourth Amendment right. But then this happened. This happened. And you know what? You black people, it's all your fault. You wanting to be part of the American dream and wanting to be free, you ruined it for all of us. You know that? It's your fault. It's all your fault. I mean, could you imagine just wanting to stand on the street corner with your friends? Could you imagine that? Not allowed. Not allowed. The cops will grab you. So what happens to John Terry? Martin McFadden's testimony is that he doesn't like how he looks. That's, that's his testimony on his police report that he looks over and sees John Terry and he says, I don't like how he looks. Okay. John Terry would spend the rest of his life in an insane asylum. He was mentally ill. He was mentally ill. If you're not familiar with this, and I looked it up recently, people who have mental illness also commonly have muscular problems in their face. I can't go into the technical terms. Remember, I talk about the law. I'm dumb and every other area. So now right here, when he grabs him, that right there then takes officer safety and it adds it to the Fourth Amendment. Matter of fact, officer safety is more important than everything else on there. Officer safety is added to the Fourth Amendment here because the people in charge of our civil liberties – the people who are in charge of these, these courts up here, the people in charge of this, they're the ones who decide the constitutionality of law, of a law. So now everybody knows, I mean, I mean this, is, you know, this is like 101 stuff, but everybody knows it, that the legislature writes laws and then the president signs them. Texas legislature wrote that Senate Bill 8, and then the executive of Texas, Greg Abbott, he signed that. And then the Supreme Court's job, what they're supposed to do is say, that's not constitutional and strike down laws that are created that go against your bill of rights that say you have a right to life. Number one, number one, you have a right to life. Number two, you have a right to assemble, you have a right to speech, you have a right to religion, you have a right to petition, you have a right to free press, your first five big freedoms. But Terry v. Ohio says that officer safety is more important than everything else. So now the big one on the Bill of Rights is what? Your right to life, right? You have a right to life. We all agree to that. Does anybody disagree? Yes, put it on there. Yes, we have a right to life. If you're born, if you're in America, do you have a right to life? Yes or no? I need to know. Do you think if you are here that you have a right to be alive? If you're walking and you're breathing air, do you have a right to be alive? Write it there. Please tell me. Please tell me. Okay. So... Now, that's just, I mean, to me, I'm not trying to cut anybody down who thinks you don't have a right to life. <laughs> I do. I think you're born and you have a right to life. Do you have a right to health care? There's a debate. There's a debate. You're going to have half the people say, da, da, da. Most people say yes. But as soon as you say, do you have a right to life? Most people say, yes, you do. You have a right to life. Okay. So now what I claimed here was that Terry v. Ohio, the ruling of the, the holding of constitutionality, what it essentially did is it added officer safety to be more important and added to your amended rights, to your Bill of Rights. And how come I would say that? Because in Tennessee v. Garner, a 1985 case, Edward Eugene Garner, a 15-year-old boy, is running away from a scene where he has stolen $10. He slipped into the neighbor's house, saw some money on the table, snatched out $10, and he ran out of the house. The police got there. The cop, this is cop's testimony. I've read the case. The cop testimony says, I saw the kid. I looked at him. I knew he wasn't armed, but then he turned and he ran off. So the cop shoots him in the back of the head. Bam. Edward Eugene Garner dies right there. Born in 19... 69 dies in 1974. The case is decided in 1985. So now what happens here is the proof, 
that I, that I just told you, that Terry v. Ohio has added to our rights. The officer safety is the most important right. The Supreme Court hears this case. The officer's testimony is that he knew the kid wasn't armed. He knew he didn't have a gun, but he knew that he had stole the money out of the guy's house. So in common law, he was a fleeing felon. That's an actual terminology. So the fleeing felon rule of common law states that you can shoot someone fleeing in the back of the head as they run. The Supreme Court disagrees with common law. The Supreme Court, the Burger Court, they say, you know what? We disagree. We don't think cops should be able to shoot you in the back of the head when you run away. We therefore hold, that's what you call a constitutional holding. We hold that it is unconstitutional to shoot you in the back of the head when you're running away. Why? Because you have a right to life. We all agreed. Everybody here said yes. I didn't see one person say no that you didn't have a right to life. Everybody put it there, didn't they? Did you type it? Did you type yes? Here's my fucking OCD kicking in, right? <laughs> Let me slow down. <laughs> so, Tennessee versus Garner has one word in it that completely nullifies our constitutional right to life. And what Tennessee versus Garner says is that it is unconstitutional for the police to shoot you in the back as you run away. Unless it's in the name of officer safety. That's the holding. That's the actual holding. That's, the, that's what the Supreme Court held. That officer safety would be deemed a necessary function to shoot you in the back as you run away. That's proof right there. That's proof. That's proof. You guys go by my website right there, pick up my ebook, get a copy of this wall graphic. My website is Delete Laws with a Z. Go by my website, pick up my ebook and my wall graphic. It's a Delete Laws with a Z. If you don't have the, 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 the cash to buy my ebook or my, 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 my wall graphic here, I will gladly give it to you for free if you just register on the website and send me an email that, hey, right through this website, through the website. Go through the website. It's really a lot easier for me. You know, that makes it a lot easier for me that I can keep track of you guys. We got to build a movement together. We have to build a movement together. So, uh, and then uh, Venmo Cash App's right there. If you want to buy me a cup of coffee, that's amazing. Thanks. Don't go crazy. Don't break your own bank. Take a screenshot with your phone and I'm going to move on and I'm going to keep teaching police state. Cool. Let's move on. So, thanks. Appreciate it. And so, so now, right, now right here, Terry v. Ohio, where we were is I kind of went on a little tangent and I jumped up to Tennessee versus Garner, but now I want to pull right back here. I was going down a line. I was going down a specific line. Some of you may have still been here from the last 20 minutes. Some of you are new, but I was going down the line and showing the specific legalities that led to a total prison state in the United States of America. I'm sorry, I can't read comments because it, it, it could trigger me and I wanna stay super focused on the lesson I'm teaching today, which is how the police state was created. How the police state was created. So, so now if, if we're here, so we were at Kerr versus California, there's where your exigent circumstances lie, where they say that you can kick, they can just go into your house because the Kerrs are marijuana dealers and the World Health Organization has deemed that marijuana is the demon drug. So, so now we're gonna push forward here just a little bit and we're gonna to get to Terry and I went over the case, the cops can run up and grab you. But the second part of Terry is that the Supreme Court carves out this super funky exception. If you listen to the Overturn Terry uh, series on my YouTube page, you can listen to the super funky exception that the Supreme Court personnel slowly together meld this idea together that if you are detained by the police, that is not seized. And the reason why is because I showed you the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, so in Terry v. Ohio, the Supreme Court, they create this kind of no man's land called detainment. Now, the reason why I say it's a no man's land is because if it's a blank slate, then when you give someone a no man's land, say here's detainment, then the police take that detainment thing and they got, a, they got a blank slate here. And that's the moment where you're involuntarily held by the police, you're not arrested, you're only detained. And you just have a brief momentary detainment. This is some of the writing of the, of the, of the holding. It's a brief holding and a light pat down for weapons. That's what the Terry holding actually says. 
is that it's a brief involuntary detainment where the officer can pat you down for officer safety. What has that turned into? What has that turned into? They gave the police a blank slate and said, you have the right to detain people, to hold them there, to see if they'll answer any questions. What have the police done with the detainment clause and the, and the, and the light pat down to check for weapons? Can you guys, can you guys pop it down in there? What, is, what, what have the police done? What have the police done? What, 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 what did they fill in on that blank slate? What was the, what was the add-in that they put on that blank slate when they gave them the blank slate of what detainment means? What does detainment mean today? I want you to answer that in your own mind. What does detainment mean? Type it down there. Type it down there. What does detainment mean? I want to know what you guys say detainment means, right? Because your idea of detainment and my idea of legal detainment underneath of law enforcement's policy of detainment is going to be a little bit different. And if you haven't been through a detainment process, that's the reason why I'm standing here teaching this today. I've been through the detainment process 40, I'd say 40, 50, 40 or 50 times because I'm a true antisocial. I lift weights like crazy and I love to wrestle and teach and fight MMA. I don't anymore. I'm over 40. I don't like to do it anymore. Don't think I'm trying to take anybody on. My tough days are long over. I'm too old, not interested in wrestling or fighting anybody anymore. There was a time I loved it. So did we write down here what detainment means? What detainment means? What does detainment mean? Anybody, what does detainment mean? Can you write it down there for me? I need to know. I need to know what your idea of what detainment means. Just tell me what it means, pretty please. Held against my will. Held against my will. Mission, uh, mission, uh, mission of crime, tough one. Can anybody here, really, I wanna be, and I'm not gonna berate you and I'm not gonna make fun of you. I might read your comment, but I won't hold, hold without reason. You're being stopped, hold against my will. Mm -hmm. For officer safety, that's a good one. Of course, that's the truth though. That's what the detainment process was created for. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to be a brief detainment where the officer can pat you down for weapons to make sure that you don't have any weapons. And let's go back to it. Let's go right into it. Why do they want to pat you down for weapons? How come they want to pat you down for weapons? How come? Who are they want to pat down? Who is it? Who is it? Right. It's these folks. It's those people. It's those people, right? These are the people who they want to pat down for weapons. So what's the result of patting people? So now the exact, I, I told you I'd get distracted if I get into civil rights stuff. So, so Terry v. Ohio is gonna pass and there's gonna be two things that are gonna greatly, greatly create the prison system that are gonna blow the system out of the water. The 1968 omnibus crime bill for the first time truly criminalizes having a gun. It criminalizes you carrying a gun. So with the combination of Terry and the cops can grab you with the, the gun control act that legally makes it so you can't carry a gun. There's no more carrying a gun. You can't go, I'm gonna go to the store, I'm gonna go to the bank, I'm gonna grab my pistol, throw it in the glove box in case anybody tries to grab me when I take the week's receipts. No more carrying a gun in the United States. Right here, that happens in 1968. And the reason why that happens is because of a multitude of cops killing black people when it's gonna be spun around and blamed that they're afraid of black people having guns. But most of the people are killed by police who are members of the KKK. It's just a simple fact. I mean, that's just a simple fact. I don't want that history to be true. My eyes are green, my other, my other half is Irish. We've been here since the Revolutionary War. I don't want that to be true, it's true, it's true. So when the Gun Control Act passes in 1968, with Terry v. Ohio, they can grab you. So this is one thing, right? There's a lot of people before the, the 60s who just like to carry a gun with them. They always carried a gun. My dad was one of them. My dad carried a gun everywhere. He always had a gun. So 
So then the, the, the really wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, where it's going to just completely come off the rails, where the prison industry that we know today. So look, you see, you see all the things I'm, I'm showing you, all the things I'm showing you so far, so far, I've said, all, I've said all these things here, right? And we haven't got to the tipping point. Now, right here, what I'm showing you is behind me as I start to move back, you can see that this prison chart is just going to start to exponentially jump. So how's that going to happen? How's that going to happen? I, I mean, tell me how that's going to happen. So it's going to happen when you take away the right of the people to carry a gun. A lot of people like to carry guns. And then you're going to get Nixon who's going to declare war on drugs. Now, I, you know, I talk about this all the time. John Erkelman, his number one, he testifies in a night... Uh, he states in a 1998 Harper Bazaar magazine that the war on drugs and criminalizing marijuana uh, and going after marijuana and, and, and heroin was just to go after black people and the hippie community who were protesting the war. So he admits it. It's, I mean, we know it's true. We know that's what happened. However, now though, with, the, with, 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 this little, with this little trifecta right here, with this little boom, bang, boom, right? So with Terry, with gun control, with the war on drugs, so now you're gonna see behind me, look what happens really quickly. Look what happens very quickly. Why does that happen so quickly? Because cops can grab you. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but you know, when I was young, uh, when cops grabbed me, I, I, I'm immediately gonna flinch. I don't wanna be grabbed. That's first and foremost, I don't wanna be grabbed. Is that, is that so bad, I don't wanna be grabbed? So when a cop grabs me, here's just first step. This is just first step of how you go to jail. Cops have the right to grab you. I'm checking for weapons, right? And can you imagine how brutal it was when there was no cameras? I mean, all the way up until 2013, 2014, it was a total shit show. Cops have the right to walk up and grab you. Right there, right there. For me, that's my entire youth. That's my whole youth. You get the right to walk up and grab me, and I'm walking around. It just. So cops have the rights to grab you, right here, Terry of Ohio. Now the Gun Control Act. I, I, I I'm not joking about this. This isn't. I'm, I'm not just saying something because I'm, I'm I'm a gun advocate and I support the Second Amendment. That's not why I'm saying this. I'm telling you guys the truth. In your brain, in your culture, in the box you were planted in, the idea of grabbing your pistol and heading to the grocery store does not apply. It does not exist. In the 60s and the 50s, all through here, there was gun classes in schools. It was very normal. Guns were very, very normal. I mean, just go back to, to Ronald Reagan and Ronald Reagan and the, I'm jumping forward here in time, not going back. Ronald Reagan is on Air Force One and he's got a rifle right there with press in the room and he's pointing down at the, at the earth from, the, from Air Force One. I mean, that's Ronald Reagan. Look up the footage. Ronald Reagan right there. Look up the footage. The media is right there on the plane and he's got his Winchester out. He's pointing down, looking at the earth, right? Guns were very, very normal. Normal. And, and remember, we had just gone through men, especially, and women as well, actually, uh, I don't, I don't want to get on a gender thing, but men and women both coming back from World War I and World War II were alive and well in 1965. World War I ends in 1918. So if you enlist in the army and you, and, and you get out and you're 22 in 1918, go 40 years ahead. That's 68. You've been carrying a gun. Not only did you go in in 1918 and get out when you're 22, World War II came and you served in World War II. Your guys need you. That's how military sees it. They re-enlist all the time because the guys in need them to come back and they don't want to leave a man behind. That's a principle of the military. We can go into Afghanistan later, but I don't want to get into it. So, so now right here, when the cops can grab you and now I, I, I told you, guns are normal. People been to World War I, World War II, Vietnam. People coming back from Vietnam, you know, they're used to carrying a gun. This is normal. They come back from Vietnam and you can't have a gun anymore. So now just think about that. You spend three years in Vietnam, 68, they pass a gun control law. You come back 71, 72, and you're used to carrying on an M16 at all times. You have a firearm on you at all times. You do not stand up from the pit without the firearm on your side, period, right? At all, you don't not, you, you do, don't not, you don't not. 
You do not walk, you don't leave the house without a gun. When you got back from Vietnam after being in World War, World War II and Vietnam, you're a gun carrier. But the police don't care. There's a gun control act. You have to, they're going to do what they're told to do. And so with the gun control act and the war on drugs, look at this. So, so where's, where's Dick Nixon? There's Dick Nixon. The prison industry, you can see it. It's ever so slightly starting to tick up. Do you see that? Ever so gently, ever so gently starting to tick up. Do you see that? And now what's going to happen is something that I just don't understand a lot about. But I'm going to explain it to you guys the best that I can because I haven't read the manual yet. I have not read it, but I'm going to read it next. I'm reading the Federalist Papers right now, so I can't read the Model Penal Code, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Go by my website, pick up my ebook, pick up my wall graphic. I have an exact replica of this wall graphic, which, by the way, six foot wall graphic buyers who have bought six foot wall graphics, finalized by Sunday. Finalized by Sunday, we'll get the order in by Monday or Tuesday. Six foot wall graphic buyers will have an order shipped hopefully by the end of next week. I'm gonna put the order in on Monday or Tuesday. Skylar is working away on that now. So that's my website, that's my YouTube page, guys. If you wanna throw a little support, you can buy it. If you don't have the money, I'll give it to you anyway. Just, just register on the website. I'll send you the wall graphic or the ebook, either one or both. I'll, I'll give them both to you, just as long as you're willing to just read it. It's a kid's book, so it's pretty easy. So uh, thank you for that, I appreciate that. Thank you for letting me plug that. So now, right here, um, this is gonna, you're gonna have the, the, the ever so slightly just br breeze up in the, in the prison industry and you notice where the stick is, right? The stick is pointing, you see where the stick is? The stick goes straight up to Terry. So you can see the prison system here just ever so gently doing this. Now you see it ever so gently, but ever so gently is like every, every line on this, on this board here is 100,000 human lives that are going to a dungeon. So even though it ever so gently is coming up the track right here, there's 100,000 people, there's 100,000 people. Now right here, so Nixon's declared war on drugs in 1972, 1971, 1971. It was 1971, yeah, it's 1971. Nixon declares war on drugs in 1971 and now what's going to happen is, so if you don't know what that means, let me, just, let me just take one second and explain exactly what that means. Because you probably really don't know what that means. So, so, and that's not your fault. It's not because they don't teach it to you in school. Because they don't want you to know what it actually means. So I'm going to tell you what, what Nixon's war on drugs, when, when he declared war on drugs, what that declaration then meant, that legislation that he signed into the budget and into the, uh, the penal system to fund the police and to fund prisons. And he, we're gonna run out of funding and that's why the prison industry is really gonna jump. I'm gonna get to that in a second. But Richard Nixon, when he declares and writes a legislated declaration that there's a war on drugs, there's nine different facets of the United States government. The government is broken up into nine different sectors. You may not know that, but it doesn't matter. They're all different sectors, they all do different things. What, you know, some are, are infrastructure, some are water, some are air, but, but, the, but the, the infrastructure of the United States government that you and I are governed under is broken up into nine sections. So when he declares war on drugs, that declaration of legislation that he signed then changes the narrative and the direction of all nine government agencies. Every United States government agency will then direct its navigation towards the war on drugs. And that's going to have absolutely catastrophic effects across the culture of the United States of America. It's gonna ruin our culture. And the reason why things suck so bad right now is because of this decision right here. When he changes the apparatus of the government functionality of to serve the people, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, at this moment, the government becomes our adversary. And the government becomes at war with the people. All nine different sections of government then change their scope to including a war on drugs vein that is, that is a, a very big vein. So 
what's going to happen is when he says, let's build new prisons, let's fund cops, and his marching orders going through John Erlichman here, Ehrlich, Ehrlichman, I'm sorry, Ehrlichman, are to arrest hippies and black people. So what this is where, if you understand what the broken window theory is, the broken window theory, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't want to jump ahead. It's underneath the Briona over here anyway, so I'm not going to pull it. But the broken window theory is the theory that anything going wrong in a neighborhood, the police can investigate and arrest. A broken window. In other words, someone breaks a window, arrest that person. And that takes the crime element out of the neighborhood. Fix that window. So that is going to be implemented later by William Bratton. But the reason why it's going to be so destructive when Bratton orders it in 1992 Three, it is because of what Nixon does with the war on drugs and his specific mandate to arrest hippies and black people. Because what Nixon's going to do is in 1970, his number, his, uh, I'm sorry, can you guys see that? His, his attorney general, the attorney general of the 19, in 1970, uh, John Ridge, uh, someone can fact check me on that, his John McConley. God bless it. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have everything memorized, but, but his, the, the attorney general of Richard Nixon, 1970, he's going to write the Controlled Substance Act. Now, why does that have any bearing? It doesn't matter, right? The Controlled Substance Act is going to list the drugs that are illegal, and it's just him. He's going to write the whole thing. He's going to write what's illegal and what's not illegal and what each sentence is going to be. This guy right here, John Ridge, John Ridgeway. What, what's, what's his name? Fuck, I can't remember his name. John McConnell, what's his name? God bless it, my OCD. I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna walk, okay? So, so he writes the Controlled Substance Act. So now you have this, you got the Terry, you got the Gun Control, you got the Substance Control Act, and then he declares war on drugs, so all government agencies are now getting funding based on their application to what they're gonna to contribute to the war on drugs. More than any, it's gonna be who? The police. The police are now going to get the majority of their funding based on drug arrests. That's why police are now chemical searchers. That's why there's DUI checkpoints. That's why they're always patting you down for chemicals. Because their funding from 1971, their funding is still based on you having a chemical in your pocket. And the four pro okay, now, now we can move forward a little bit. So now you have to understand that. He orders the nine sections of government to focus their funnel at the war on drugs. So now when we're going to move forward a little bit right here, we're going to pop over to Reagan. So Nixon, he's going to have to step down. Gerald Ford's going to take over. And then Jimmy Carter's going to be in office. Jimmy Carter's kind of a slap dick, whatever. I mean, he's a nice guy, but he's not really much of a real hardcore leader. And plus the times are, are not, not really um, – there's no leadership. I mean, that's just a simple fact. We've always had – poor leadership and Jimmy Carter's right along there. He's a good doer. If you don't know what Jimmy Carter did in his life, he's an amazing doer as far as him doing, not a great leader. Whereas Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan was a great leader. Just a horrible, 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 horrible human. But a great leader, very great leader, great actor. So here's what Reagan does. Nixon has gotten in, and now police can grab you if they're suspicious. There's no guns. you got a substance control act. Their police's funding is based on Richard Nixon's war on drugs, with pointing all government apparatus at the war on drugs. So then Reagan gets in, and what is he doing? He did the same thing Obama did with, with George Bush. Reagan, uh, Dick Nixon drove us into the ditch. Ronald Reagan's going to just keep on driving down that ditch. History just always repeats itself. It just always repeats itself. So this guy does a shithead thing, and then this guy's like, you know what I'm gonna do? Reagan's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call the boys, I'm gonna call the boys, I'm gonna make some money out of this. So Reagan right here, he says, he goes, you know what? They got a war on drugs, everything's illegal. We got all this money in copping. We don't have enough space. We don't have enough space. So at this point here though, just so you guys know, the white population of prison, the majority of people in prison before the 60s, before the 50s, it's 80% white. In the, go look up the Department of Justice prison statistics. In the 40s and 50s, it's mostly white people in prison. Because you get arrested and you're black, you're going back to work, and you're going to go and they're going to work out a thing where you're going to go work 
for someone, for nothing. I mean, this is the way it was, sharecropper, right? It doesn't matter. So, I mean, it does, but you know what I'm saying. So, so, so now Reagan right here, uh, he gets, he, uh, Nixon drives us in a ditch. And so then Reagan, he calls up his buddies and he's like, hey, listen, guys, listen. Dick Nixon set the agenda, and so we got this war on drugs. So you see how far apart the numbers are with Gerald Ford? And so th these are the numbers between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. And then with Reagan, look how fast the 100,000 gains go. Look how fast those hundreds, I mean, they double, right? The gains of people being locked in a dungeon double. They double, right? So, so what, what happened? What happened? Ronald Reagan started the for-profit prison industry right here in 1982. And so now what that's going to do, so now you're looking at this giant trifecta. Oh, I'll, let me throw in the fax machine thing for you guys. I haven't done the fax machine for you guys. I realized that the other day when I was telling a story to someone else. So, you know, the other day we all saw that McDonald's worker who um, he had went and picked up his paycheck. You guys see that? Type in there for me, yes or no. Type in there for me. Do you guys see that McDonald's worker who went to go pick up his paycheck? Can you guys just type that in for me? Yes, I did. No, I did not. That way I know how many people heard the story. Yes, I did. No, I did not. No, yes. You saw that? No, yes. How many? Just type it. Help me out. This helps me. This helps me, you guys. I've been up here for like an hour teaching, so just help me a little bit so I kind of can get a barometer for how many people are tuned into the things that I see and stuff like that. It just helps. You know, I like to know what's going on. I spend all my time doing this, so I don't, I don't look outside. I, don't, I very rarely hear of even new people who've been murdered by the police. I just, uh, thank you, I appreciate it. I, I can't read comments for long because as soon as I look down, a troll will say something horrible to me. So, <laughs> okay, so now just take your finger, double tap on that screen for me, double tap, just do this. Do this 10 times and then I'm gonna keep going. Just go 10 times like this and then I'm gonna keep going, all right? Thanks a lot, I really appreciate it, thank you. It, 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 my birthday in like six hours, six hours and it's my birthday. And I'm gonna be another year older. I hope I make it. Stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, baby. Okay, so now right here, what's gonna happen uh, in 1980, here's the big twist for you guys. So you saw that McDonald's worker, I'm sorry, I, I, I told you I can get lost and stuff. The McDonald's worker the other day when he got put on his knees and they put him at gunpoint, the manager's like, so the other day a black guy, he goes and gets his paycheck at McDonald's. I mean, the guy's working at McDonald's, right? I hope, hopefully it's at least 15 an hour. So he goes and picks up his paycheck. He hangs out for a few minutes with this. When you work in McDonald's, you gotta make friends with people. You know, I worked in fast food when I was young. And so, so he goes and picks up his paycheck. The cops are called because there's been a, someone said there's a break in or a robbery somewhere in the local area or whatever, but he fit the description. So this is 1980. This is the beginning of the fax machine becoming a standardized tool inside of police cars. This is a very big deal. A lot of people have never heard this. They've never correlated it. So when the fax machine is developed, and now if I'm driving down the road and I'm a cop, I get a fax, right? But if you, if you know anything about fax machines, then you know they only blot black or white ink. There is no gray at all on a fax machine. It either puts a blot on the piece of paper black or puts a blot on the piece of paper white. That's it, there's no in between. There's no gray, there's no other colors. So they would send a fax over to a police car and it would be a young black male. And here would be the picture. I mean, I, I'm laughing because can you imagine, can you imagine you're walking down the road and a cop pulls up, 80s, <laughs> in the 80s, whips his gun out, Hey, you fit the description. Shows you the picture, and it's a it's a freaking fax of a picture of a black guy. Fax machines only blot in black and white ink. So anyway, the term uh, that you fit the description, this is the beginning of that terminology because when you send a fax to someone with someone's skin color on it, they're either white or black. They're not Mexican. They're not Asian. They're white or black. There's no real in between. So. The, 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 I, I used to, I, w I went all the way down the line with the studying of the fax machine. I studied it all the way to the beginning, when the fax machine was invented, how it was first used, who were the first users of it, who were the first proponents of it. So in 1980, because the, the, the modern uh, step up of the fax machine, the way it worked, it was then able to be, uh, it, was, it was then federally mandated in all police, police, office, uh, police stations, all. So this is the first time that you're gonna get a fax of a picture of someone, but it only blots in black ink. 
So now, right here, when he creates the for-profit prison, now you're really going to start to jump here, right? You, you can see it. I mean, you, uh, the, each one's 100,000. I, I mean, I can get in close if you want, but you can just see. So now we're, with Reagan, we're at 600,000 people. We're at 700,000 people. We're at 800,000 people. We're at not, so with Reagan, by the time he gets out in 88, we're almost a million people living in a dungeon. It's, it's more than over Reagan's tenure. It went from a half a million to over a million. Reagan in his, in his tenure doubled the prison population. So what else did Reagan do? I said that Reagan is a horrifically bad person. What else did he do? Why would I say that? He also oversaw the crack epidemic where the CIA manufactured, created crack and dropped it off in South Central LA. And the reason the CIA was doing that was so they could fund wars around the world. Maybe you've heard of this thing called the Iran-Contra scandal. If you've never heard of the Iran-Contra scandal, you can directly associate that with crack. Because the CIA was dealing drugs that they were getting from the Middle East. They, that's why we were in Afghanistan at all whatsoever. The only reason we've ever been in Afghanistan is because of the opium fields and because of the, the chemical that goes in your phone. I can't remember the name of it. Remember, I only, know, I only know the stuff I read, so I only know my particular scope of information. So, so now, right here, when he creates the for-profit prison industry, so he's gonna get out, he's gonna be in from 81 to 89, and then George Herbert Bush is gonna be president of the United States, and George Herbert Bush is going to enhance the for-profit prison industry. So what does that mean, essentially? So that means when, you, when, when I say that for-profit prison industry, what does that really mean? I mean, I mean from, from, if, if I'm a layman and I don't, don't really understand legislation and law, and I don't understand, when you say for-profit prison industry, you know, everybody's, you, you, when you put that in your head, what you think is that you're like, oh, you know, I go to prison and someone's making money on the other end. Sure, yes, that's true. There's a lot of steps in there though that you need to understand when I say when you allow a for-profit prison industry to exist. And here's the exact process. So number one, when Reagan creates the for-profit prison industry, who does he call? He calls it a for-profit prison industry to exist. And here's the exact process. So number one, when Reagan creates the for-profit prison industry, who does he call? He calls his I've created laws against crack, and now I'm going to uh, uh, create laws against crack that are gonna be like 30 times worse than having cocaine, and so we should invest in this for-profit prison industry. So now, what's gonna happen? What did I just say? I said crack is gonna have 32 times the prison sentence of cocaine. Who wrote that legislation? Who wrote that down on a piece of paper? Who was it? Reagan? Was it the legislature? So when the for-profit prison industry comes in and it's big business, and it's big, and it's and it's it's big business, right? So who who funds the for-profit prison industry? Who funds the legislature? Who fund who funds Congress? Who pays for your congressman? For your senator? Who pays the for-profit prison industry? So then they have what's called a lobby on K Street in Washington D.C. It's an actual street in Washington D. Street in D.C. called K Street. Down K Street is the Civic Corps for-profit prison lobby office. And what they do is they pay for your senator, your congresswoman, your local election, your, even in your local election, the for-profit prison industry might fund your legislator. So what they do is legislators, what they do in Congress and in your state legislature, they submit bills into Congress. Here's a bill that I wrote, I'm submitting this into committee. The committee will then bat that around and decide if it's gonna be voted on on the floor. So what happens here is the for-profit prison industry then writes the legislation for the state of Missouri for your penal codes. So that now the state of Missouri penal codes, the defining understanding of the law and what is arrestable, this is an arrestable offense, this is an arrestable offense, this is an arrestable offense. It's turned in by your representative, but it's written by the lobby on K Street in Washington, D.C. And when they take your congressman out to lunch, they just slide the brief right over. 
I'm talking about the 80s and 90s, but you know what I mean. So, so now, now you understand. So when I talk about the for-profit prison industry here, it's not that there's just someone on the other end getting money. That's not what that is. It's that there's someone in legislation, creating legislation, that says that you can be arrested for this particular crime, whatever they decide that is a particular crime. I'll tell you guys a personal story and then I'll jump on. So in 1998, in 1998, I was jet skiing in Dallas, Texas. Early 20s, very early, 21, 22, I don't know how old I was then, but it doesn't matter, here's the point. I'm on the jet ski and you're not allowed to jet ski after dark on the lake, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. You're not allowed to jet ski on the, on the lake after dark. Everybody knows that. I know that. Of course it's going to be a law. I understand that. We're in a little lagoon back trolling and my friends are drinking. But I, I don't really drink alcohol, so I'm not drinking. I'm just hanging out, having fun with my friends. And the sun is setting on the lake and it's so beautiful. And so I jump on the jet ski and I just go on the lagoon because there's nobody in the lagoon. We're the only ones back there. And I hit this, this brody and I whip this shoe, this big arcing spray goes across the sky. It's beautiful. And I'm in my early 20s, so you're really all ego then. You know, you're bravado. And, I, and then out of the corner of my eye, as my way back into the boat to dock the jet ski, boo, I see that red and blue flash. I'm like, oh man, it's a cop. I jump off the jet ski, I get on the boat. It's a pretty big boat. And the cop's like, yo, I need to see some ID. And I'm like, all right, sorry, man. And he, and he goes, uh, jet ski after dark's breaking the law. I said, I... I said, you're right. I said, I'm sorry. Uh, let me get my ID. I go over and I give the cop my ID and I go, here you go, here's my ID. He takes his ID, he takes it like this, he puts it in his pocket, he goes, thank you very much. Turn around, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest. I said, what? He said, you're under arrest. I, I, I'm like 22 or something, I don't know. I'm like, what are you talking about I'm under arrest? I said, I haven't, I, I just, you know? The cop tells you you're under arrest, you're in front of all your friends, you're on a boat, you're in your shorts, you don't have a shirt on, you're under arrest, what would what, I do? Jet skiing after dark is an arrestable offense. Would you, could you, follow me here, follow me. I sat in jail for three days before they let me out. The whole time I was in there, I just burning mad, you know? When I got out of jail, I, when I started my research, when I started my research, uh, in 2002 is when I really began research. I found out that the Texas state legislature in 1997 had been bought up by the for-profit prison industry called Civic Corps. And that the Civic Corps executives, their lobby, had written the, te the Texas state legislature as to what would be a arrestable offense and what was not an arrestable offense. Riding your jet ski after sunset was an arrestable offense. Can you imagine the prick who arrested me grabbing a 22-year-old kid and putting him in handcuffs for doing a Brody on water? Nobody around, no victim. Could you imagine the human being who did that to me? And then when they arrested me, they had created a funnel system. I got on the boat, I went over across the lake, and when I got there, there was a truck there with four more cops. Back of the truck open, ready to, to it was like a perfect system to just funnel people into a dungeon. I found out later it's the for-profit prison industry. So, so now right here, you got Reagan, you got Reagan, he creates this for-profit prison industry, and then uh, George H. Bush. Now the real problem, and, and, and sorry if you're on the left and you're a Biden supporter, but here's the real problem. That 1994 crime bill, that 1994 crime bill. The 1994 crime bill coupled with, with the uh, broken window theory, these two things right here, not good, not good, not good at all. So, you know, you have to get, you know, you have to get into the like the nitty gritty of the crime bill though. You can't just say the 1994 crime bill. You have to get into the minutia of the bill when you read it. You have to really understand what the 1994 crime, crime, 1994 crime bill did and what it does today. The 1994 crime bill is the most active piece of criminal legislation on the books today. 
the laws that are being pushed, the sentence mandates, all these different things that come from the 1994 crime bill are the laws today. Specifically, the 1994 crime bill has two different functionalities that should scare the hell out of you. And they scare me. So, I mean, I can't be scared. You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. So, so the 94 crime bill, it has something called the COPS program. Community Oriented Policing Services. Community Oriented, it's, it's right here. You, you can't read it from there, but it, that's what it says. It's a program within the legislation of the 1994 crime bill. And what does it do? So I'm here in West Hollywood, California. I'm right here, I'm, I'm right here in West Hollywood. I got a sheriff's department right down here. The, the LA Sheriff's Department is right down there. Just right down the street, the LA Sheriff's Department. So, so what happens, the LA Sheriff's Department, the city of West Hollywood, the city council gets together. I'm just, I'm just gonna speak hypothetically here just so you guys know. The West Hollywood Sheriff's Department gets together and they go, you know what, man? We have enough West Hollywood Sheriffs. We're gonna cut the budget by $2 million so that we can shed four officers, right? So, the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department, they, they, they look at the appropriations bill. They take a look at the appropriations bill that the West Hollywood City Council has appropriated for funding. And they look at that and they go, man, you know you're gonna cut four officers, huh? So they then apply to the Judge Advocate General Fund that attaches to the COPS program. This is a federal fund that will distribute new police officers to your city, town, borough, district, state trooper, you name it. This right here is what will allow your particular, so by the way, you know how the appropriations work, right? The city writes out appropriations for funds. We've raised this much tax dollars, here's the appropriation of the fund. So appropriation is just distribution or here's the spread, here's how much money we're gonna send out. We take this much taxes in, here's where we're gonna spend our money. We got $27 million, here's how we're gonna spend the $27 million. Parks, the street, whatever, right? So you get into it. So what the COPS program does is the, the police in your town, your city, wherever you are, they skip the appropriations bill. They skip going through applying for new funding for new police officers. They simply apply through the Judge Advocate General Fund. They say, we need four more cops here in West Hollywood. So the appropriations that West Hollywood does, it goes through and they cut $2 million of funding. But then the, the Judge Advocate General Fund, they just fund four new cops. And then after, I don't, I, by the way, I can't find the literature on it. I don't know when the funding from the federal government turns off from the Judge Advocate General Fund. But when the funding from the Judd Advocate General Fund is turned off for those new cops, that appropriation bill will now go on your city, your town, your state. So that park you guys were gonna put in for the kids, you know, we got six new cops over the last two years. We got a pension to think about. We got healthcare to think about for these cops. You know, we're gonna have to reappropriate our funds here based on that the police applied to the Judd Advocate General Fund. However, the funding for those police cut off this year. So we're gonna to need to dip into that city budget. And the, it's, it's, it's a constant battle. That's why we have to get rid of the police unions. They have to be dissolved. We have to get rid of them. So, so then the second part, and, and you guys saw this, here's what the 94 crime, there's, there's three parts. Section uh, 4033 as well. Let me just list that real quick because this one's already written. Section 2033 or 4033. God bless it. I have dyslexia, so sometimes my brain messes things up. But it's section, I'm pretty sure it's 4033 of the 1994 crime bill, appropriates military gear returning from the Middle East to your local police department. That's the 94 crime bill. If you see your cops all done up like G.I. Joe, that's from section 4033 of the 1994 crime bill that appropriates returning used military gear to your local police department. And that bypasses your regulations or anything that your city or your town wants to do. That goes straight through federally through the 1994 crime bill. So when they left all those weapons behind in Afghanistan and wherever else we've gone over and just destroyed their countries, um, then what, 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 what this does is it says that the equipment coming back, the guys coming back with that equipment on. So when you leave Afghanistan, when you leave uh, Iraq, when you have all that gear on, you don't drop it on the ground and leave it there. You take it home with you. And then when you get off the plane, they take it from you and they put it in the, the locker. And then what happens is, is your cops apply for it through section 4033 of the crime bill and then it goes to your town. And then you see a guy who looks like G.I. Joe who is completely unrelatable in, in every way. 
He put on all that war gear to go against who? You. When every boot he strapped, every buckle he snapped, every magazine he clipped and clacked and, and clocked, every weapon he put on his body is for you. So, so then the third part of the 1994 crime bill that's disgusting that creates this a massive, tyrannical, unsupervised police state from – and it's a dark police state. It's not even a light police state. Operation Relentless Pursuit, another part of the 1994 crime bill that was written by Joe Biden and signed by Bill Clinton. And what this says here is that Operation Relentless Pursuit is where they're going to combine all of the federal agencies, CIA, FBI, ICE, ATF. They all come together to form one unit to share information. You guys saw that last year in Portland in 2020 when there was a big fight in downtown Portland. When you saw those federal police kidnap that guy off the street and no one knew where he went, he went to a dark site. You have a combination of federal agents who all get together that don't have a third party to have to answer to. So what do you think is going to happen? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. As long as we have no checks and balances on police, don't think it's going to get better. I don't care what George Floyd bill you write. I don't care what you think. I don't care what court thing you come up with. Nothing gets better until there's checks and balances. I don't give a shit what laws changed. It doesn't matter to me. If you go outside and there's Terry v. Ohio that still exists, you're done. Cop walks up to you, I'm suspicious of you, get on your knees. And if you don't, my friend, if you do not get on your knees, let me introduce you to 62 different people on my wall. Let me introduce you to all of them. I can't because I'll cry in front of thousands of people and I don't want to cry in front of thousands of people. But I have several times right here on these lives. Go by my deletelaws.com, register so I have your information. When you get an email from me that says this is not a drill, that means it's time to peacefully petition, it's time to peacefully march, it's time to take our rights back from an unelected Supreme Court. And you know this because of Senate Bill 8. Roe v. Wade was decided in 1972. It files under the Ninth Amendment. These guys are supposed to respect jurisprudence. Go back to Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings at the Senate. They said, are you going to respect the jurisprudence of Roe v. Wade? Brett Kavanaugh was one of the ones who dissented to hear the Senate Bill 8. We have a tyrant on the Supreme Court. He must be impeached. We must impeach these people who voted against upholding the Constitution. Just swing by my website. Go by my YouTube page, Delete Laws, and watch some of those videos. Swing by there and watch some of those videos. And now I'm going to get into a little bit more specifics. As you know, I have to sell stuff to keep teaching every day. So apologies. Sorry. <laughs> if you can't afford it, I'll give it to you for free. Nothing. It won't cost you anything. It'll be yours for nothing. Just go to the website and register. Yo, dude, I want that ebook. Yo, dude, I want that wall graphic. I'll send it to you for free. So, so now there's going to be a couple things here that are going to happen that are going to rock the system, that are going to rock the system, where you and I have no recourse, that the rule has been set, and therefore, whatever happens to you is perfectly fine. And so what I'm talking specifically about are two different cases based on use of force. And this is critical that you understand this. I, I, I stripped them, I, I stripped the pictures. So there's two different cases that if you don't know them, there's a very good chance that you'll make a mistake. Or you'll hear someone say something that they're, how they're gonna behave if they get arrested or they have to deal with a cop. And what they're gonna say, you're gonna hear me now, and you're gonna go, dude, don't do that. So the first one is gonna be the 1980 case of Johnson versus Glick. I'm sorry I don't have the picture up here. I, I must have taken it down, but I've been extraordinarily busy the last few days. Johnson versus Glick in 1980, this Supreme Court holding, it, so remember what's going on. So what I teach is not simple facts. It's not the fact of Johnson versus Glick. That's not what's important in this particular case. Let's get specific. 
Johnson versus Glick passes that says you don't have a right to file a civil rights violation if the guards beat you up. That's what it says. I mean, pretty much that it's not cruel and unusual punishment if the guards beat you up if you go to jail. Why did that happen in the year 1980? How come? Well, we know why. Have you been here for a few minutes? We know that the prison system's gonna take off in 1968, 1969, and by the time it gets to 1980, it's packed. Not enough, not enough guards, not enough cages, not enough buildings to house human beings. There's not enough dungeons, right? So what happens when you pack a room, a dungeon full of antisocial men who were raised in poverty, who don't have any money, probably had an alcoholic mom or dad or no mom or dad. What happens when you pile a bunch of people in a room because the prison industry is flying, what happens to those people? They become full of consternation. They become full of anxiety. It becomes like a Lord of the Flies environment. And so in 1980, the prison population is just bursting at the seams. You know that because we just went over Ronald Reagan will start the for-profit prison industry to house the human souls who we're going to destroy. And so here, right here, the, the, the guards are at crescendo because there's just too many frickin' people in prisons in 1980. So when Australia Johnson is beaten up, hospitalized, and almost dies from the beating the, the prison guards give him, he sues and takes his, court, his case to the Supreme Court. If you are black, please don't take your case to the Supreme Court. Do us that favor. Let the Britain hunters of the world change things at the Supreme Court level. Because if it's you, they'll screw us all. And that's just the history of time. Australia Johnson was black. He got the hell beat out of him. He was in a hospital dying. He gets out and says, this man, I'm suing. They go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that if the guards beat you up and they hurt you badly, that is not a civil rights violation. The guards are just keeping order. The prisons are over full. And if you've gone to prison, then you must be a disagreeable person. So if you go to jail in the United States of America, just know that you cannot file a civil rights violation. If you somehow, if the guards just beat the shit out of you, which every time I was in jail, I saw the guards beat the shit out of someone. If you get in jail and you don't somehow politically, democratically, intelligently make sure that you don't get on the wrong side of those guards, they can beat the shit out of you to the point where you almost die. And the Supreme Court said that, it, it, by the way, I, I listened to the oral arguments on OYEZ, O-Y-E-Z dot org. Go to O-Y-E-Z dot org. You can listen to the oral arguments. I listen to as many as I possibly can. Um, and when you listen to the oral arguments, you're going to hear that William Rehnquist, who will eventually be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Was he Chief Justice then? Anyway, he says, or did I read it? And I could hear his disgusting voice in my head. Uh, he says, um, so are we going to file a 1983 for every prisoner who files? Are we going to have a court case for every prisoner who files a 1983? A 1983 is another legal term for a civil rights violation. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah. You have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and due process. You have the right to, to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. So yeah, yeah. If someone says they're abused or beaten by the guards and they end up in hospital, yeah, we should investigate that and arrest those guards. Yeah. If you're going to throw someone in a fucking dungeon, then you should be responsible for their fucking life. How about that? Is that so wrong? Is that so wrong? Am, am, I, am I out of bounds here? But no. So just so you know, if you get put in a dungeon, if the cops arrest you, figure it out. Figure out how to get along. Just so you know, I've been in jail 40 times, 50 times, arrested 40 or 50 times, right? Uh, every time I was in jail, you know, um, I mean, maybe my very early 20s, I may have been a little bit more loosey-goosey because of the amount of energy I have. But after my mid-20s, the times I went to jails, um, to jails, um, you know, I, 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 I had read Johnson versus Glick. I, I read Johnson versus Glick. I'd read the case on case law, case text. And I knew that you don't have any sort of, of rebuttal. If, and I'm a real A personality. It's very funny, you know, I, 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 I could take a snapshot of myself in jail and I'm just like a mute, like a, I was just a mute. I mean, within, uh, I've been in jail 40 times maybe, you know, uh, and every time 
I become a model prisoner. Matter of fact, as soon as I've been in there after like 10 or 12 hours, the guards always are like, hey, can you be a trustee? I was a, I've been a trustee in like 10 jails in America. <laughs> oh, by the way, I don't have a criminal record, but I got arrested because I'm not gonna back down to a cop on the street and that's why I got arrested. Literally, I'm not gonna back down to you. And then you're not gonna tell me what to do. And I was in my 20s and I'm not gonna be told what to do. And so they would arrest me. I got arrested one time for not having ID. I didn't have identification for jet skiing. One time standing at a party, just standing there, they arrested me. Um, you know, I'm a lightning rod, so it, it, my whole life I've always said I'm a lightning rod. Now it, we're showing what, the, what my purpose is, is to educate you guys so that you guys can pick up the mantle of this and say that Johnson versus Glick is unconstitutional. Johnson versus Glick says you can't file a 1983 if the guards beat you up, they're just keeping order and that has to change. That has to change. That, that has to change. And then the other one, the other use of force one that you have to know is Graham versus Connor. Graham versus Connor is a 1989 Supreme Court case. Um, so you guys, I put, I put Rodney King here. Does, does anybody, did anybody see the Rodney King beating? If you guys saw the Rodney, put yes, yes, I saw, no, I did not. Just type that in there for me real quick. Yes, I saw, no, I did not. Yes, I saw, no, I did not. Did you guys see the Rodney King beating? Did anybody see the Rodney King beating? Did anybody see that? Anybody see it? Yes, 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 no, no, no. If you haven't seen the Rodney King beating, yes, no, yes. Anybody, yes, so most of you guys saw it. Yes, yes, no, yes, no. So now remember, um, so we talked about how you can't just talk about the for-profit prison industry. You have to talk about the war on drugs, packing the prisons, and then this creating a gigantic uh, anxiety within the prison system between the guards and having not enough money, not enough funding. And so you get this, this, this gigantic uh, outburst of people who've been locked in a dungeon for no reason. So now Graham versus Connor is going to be decided in 1989. The reason why uh, Rodney King is there is because in 1989, the Supreme Court held these guys here. They said that the use of force on the scene will be determined by the reasonable officer on scene. That's the law. If you didn't know that, that's the law. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen me audit, but I, I don't go, let them get anywhere near me. Because, because Graham versus Connor states that the reasonable officer on the scene will determine how much force to be used. So just three years later, we see Rodney King and they got the sticks and they're whacking him and they're whacking him, right? He didn't lay on his belly. We talked about earlier the detainment policies of Terry. The Supreme Court said there's a detainment section here for officer safety, they can pat you down. The detainment policies are now a POW style of arrest, immediately. I'm suspicious of you, guns at your head, get on your knees, do it now. That's Terry v. Ohio. You know, and by the way, I keep on seeing all these things that say walking while black, walking dog while black, driving while black, right? Every time you see it, I need you to do me a favor. Type right underneath of it, that's a Terry stop. We need to identify the actual problem. Every time I see walking while black, drinking while black, parking while black, you name it, you name it. Cops have the right to walk up and investigate you. You're not walking while black and being harassed by the police. They're doing their job. Their job is to stop you if they're reasonably suspicious of you. And they could say they were reasonably suspicious of you because they thought they recognized you, that you were a felon that they knew previously. And then after they completely ruin you, they can go, you know what, it's not the same guy. But it doesn't matter. You still go through detainment. And what's detainment? A POW style arrest upon suspicion. On your knees, on your belly, gun at your head. And these guys just got back from World War II. They just got back from World War II. They just got back from Vietnam. Pointing a gun at your head and telling you to follow orders? Easy. Easy for them. Easy for them. For you and me? No way, dude. Pull a gun out and point it at your head? No way. No way. No way. Not a chance. So, so now Graham versus Connor, a 1989 ruling, they're going to say use of force is going to be determined by the reasonable officer on the scene. When Rodney King got beaten to death, the jury ruled that the reasonable officer applied the amount of force that they deemed appropriate. Acquitted. All the police were acquitted. None of those police got in any trouble at all. Nobody did. 
They got back pay. They all got bonuses. They all got awards. How come that happened to Rodney King? Because of the Supreme Court case called Graham versus Connor. Tell your friends. Graham versus Connor says that the reasonable officer on the scene will determine the appropriate amount of force to use on you. That the officer can also, just so you know, the officer can take in facts that you may have done before you got here. So he may decide that before you got here, you killed your parents and you stuffed them into a barrel. And so he believes from the beginning he's dealing with someone who's a psychopath. And he starts from there. So the amount of force he uses on you is objectively reasonable given the circumstances he created in his mind. I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding. This is real law. This is the real law. I'm not joking. This is the actual law. I only teach facts, only facts. Go by my website, go by my website. Just a couple more hours, a couple more hours. Go by my website, Delete Laws. Go by my YouTube page. Go by that YouTube page and watch those videos. I need you to comment on those videos. I need you to like those videos. I need you to subscribe to those videos. The message of Overturn Terry has only been here since Juneteenth. I came out of the darkness Juneteenth. We don't know each other. You and me are not friends. I don't know you. Why would you be here for 30 minutes? How come you'd be here for an hour? Why would you be here? Why do you check in? Why are you a regular? Because of this. This has got nothing to do with me. I'm a peon, man. I'm nothing but a peon. I don't matter. Let me just tell you something. If I died in my apartment, if I died in my apartment, I don't have a wife and kids. It would take a few days before someone knew I was dead. <laughs> I'm a peon. I don't have any money. I'm just a normal guy. I'm a peon. We don't matter. We are peons to them. We're peons to them. Terry v. Ohio allows police to seize you upon their suspicion, to detain you upon their suspicion. In 2009, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote an opinion that said, if you're the passenger in a car, Terry Lyles apply to you too. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote the opinion that she said her exact words, just so you know, because I've memorized her holding. She said, in a path-making case, in a path-making case, you tyrant witch, in a path-making case called Terry v. Ohio, we've already determined that if an officer pulls you over, that you've been seized. So naturally, all the passengers in the car are also seized. What does detainment mean? What does detainment mean? What does detainment mean? What does detainment mean? Can someone write down there what detainment means? If you're the passenger in the car and the officer reasonably believes that you could be armed, what happens? What does detainment mean? What does detainment mean? What does detainment mean? What does it mean? Anybody? I just want to know if you guys know what it means. Detainment means what? Handcuffs on your belly, on your knees. Get on your knees. Shut the fuck up. Get on your knees. Get on your belly. Get on your knees. Get on your belly. I'm the passenger. I was going to get a Slurpee, bro. Ah, you fit the description. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. How many people here have had a gun pointed at their head by a cop? How many people here? How many people here have had a gun pointed at their head by a police officer? How many people here have had a gun pointed at the police officer? How many people? Any, I need you to tell me no or yes. Yes, me, yes or no? Yes, you've had a gun pointed at your head? Who's had a gun pointed at their head by a police officer? Who has? How many people? How many people? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Lots of yeses. More, yes, more yeses than I thought. More, yes, no, no, no. Yes, yes, I have. Yes, no. Shotgun, yes, no. Who's had a gun pointed at their head more than once? Who's had a SWAT officer point a sniper rifle at you? How many people? <laughs> That's why you're here. That's why half of these people said yes. That's why you're here right now. This is a bullshit system. There's no exigent circumstance about alcohol. There's no exigent circumstance about marijuana. But the exigent circumstances clause still exists. That they can get in your house as quick as they can so they can seize evidence against you. What a load of shit. You need to seize the evidence? You got to hurry? Hurry, hurry, hurry? If you're a meth dealer right now, if you're a methamphetamines dealer, you're a drug dealer right now, 
And I don't care how many drugs you claim you have. Let's just say. This is a story. We're not here. right? But if you're a drug dealer right now, if the cops no-knock raid your home, and let's just say you got a pound of drugs, whatever kind of drugs you want, is anything going to change? Will anything change today? Will anything change? Will anything get better? They kicked down the... Uh, in South Los Angeles today, they kicked down the door of a narcotics dealer and they got one pound of drugs and they got four guns and they arrested four people. Okay. Is anything going to get better? You think I'm not going to do blow or meth or heroin or crack? You think that you arresting those people and fucking terrorizing them? You think that's going to make the world a better place today? Is the world a better place? I mean, I'm just asking you guys. Just vote on that for me, will you? Yes, the world's a better place today, or no, the world is not. Don't, wait, what's the saying that conservatives have? What do conservatives say? Make America great again. That's their saying, isn't it? Is today better than yesterday? Is today better? Are we doing better or worse? Is it yes, better, no, worse? What is it? Is it are we better or are we worse today? Is the, is the, is the drug, I mean, you can't even call it a drug epidemic. People want to do drugs. These people who sleep in a tent out here, that sleep in a tent. You guys saw me yesterday, I ran down, tried to help a homeless guy that I give food to and water to all the time. Is the world any better? Are our tax dollars being used in the right way? Are things better for us? You know, we, we pay taxes and you, know, you have all these, these, these things here in America, but most of our money is spent on wars and cops and cages. We're not getting anything for our money. Only the super elites who fly to space are getting anything. The rest of us are fucking dying, working 60 hours a week. You guys, you guys think that, that, that I'm living a picnic? Are you fucking kidding me, man? I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard for me, it's hard for everybody. I'm blessed in this fact that I can just teach and talk and make a living. Not much of a living, but enough, enough. Which by the way, Stephanie, I got your Venmo, thank you. I appreciate that, thanks Stephanie. Your regular, right? We have to get together guys, you gotta teach your friends. It can't be just me and you. You have to talk to your friends about Terry versus Ohio. You've got to talk to your friends about overturning Terry. You've gotta start that conversation. You know, listen, the reason why I'll give you my products, if you don't have any money, I don't care if you got money or not. I want you to put this wall graphic up in your living room. I want you to put it up in your kitchen. You can get the, listen, next week I'm gonna have one that is indestructible and small, 36 inches, 22 inches. We're finally finishing it this weekend. By the way, it's not gonna look like that finally. It won't, that's not the final version of what we're coming out with this next week. I finally got Skylar to really dig into this thing and really put his time into it. But he was going through school. He was finishing school in Africa. He was finishing his school. And I don't want to mess up his school, but I needed him to do this graphic. And now he's full on doing the graphic. So I want you guys to put this up because when you zoom in, I want you to talk about Cruikshank. I want you to talk about Supreme Court cases. But the one I want you to talk the most about is Terry versus Ohio. Please, please talk to your friends. Please talk to your family, especially if you're a conservative. I've been talking lately about messaging. We got to change the message. Stop, stop saying stupid shit. So... As, as usual, I can get sidetracked. I was teaching exactly how the penal system was created. So, so now we're at 89, Graham versus Connor, that says that use of force will be determined by the reasonable officer on the scene, meaning that there's no checks and balances. The cop who's there is going to be the one who determines how much force to use against you. So what happened to Eric Garner? What was that cop's name? He believed that this was the appropriate amount of use of force. Did that cop, did that cop go to jail? Did the cop who, who killed Eric Garner, did he go to jail? Yes or no? Did he? Tell me. I don't want to talk to myself. Did Eric Garner, did the cop who killed Eric Garner go to jail? Did he go to jail? Did we not watch Eric Garner get snuffed out in front of millions and millions of people? Did millions of people see Eric Garner get choked out by a guy with a badge on? Yes. How come he could do that? Graham versus Connor. The use of force will be determined by the reasonable officer on the scene. You and I said arrest that guy right away. Why didn't he get arrested? Because use of force will be determined by the reasonable officer on the scene. Daniel Pantaleno, whatever his name was, he was the reasonable officer. 
He decided because he was a large black man that choking him on the ground was appropriate. That was the appropriate amount of force to be used. And until recently, you could choke people at police departments. Very regular. I had an interview with a cop the other day. What did he say? I endorsed the chokehold. What the hell's wrong with you? How many people do we go out to get choked out? What's wrong with you? But how come though? Answer the question. I need you to answer the question. Why did Eric Garner get murdered in front of millions? How many millions of people? 50 million? 100 million? How many people have not seen the death video of Eric Garner? If you haven't seen it, then tell me. Say, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Tell me. Have you seen it? Yes, I've seen it. Tell me. I want to know if you've seen it. He gets snuffed the fuck out. I'm getting fired up. It was Graham versus Connor. So please, someone type it down there, okay? Can you please type it down there? Will you please type it for me? Graham versus Connor. I want you to type it with your fingers. I want you to type it out. Graham versus Connor is the reason why Eric Garner could be legally departed by a law enforcement officer. The law enforcement officer who choked out Eric Garner and ultimately killed him did not break the law. Daniel Pantelano, whatever his name was, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to his particular heritage. I don't like the guy who murdered Eric Garner. However, he didn't break the law when he murdered him. There's a Supreme Court ruling called Graham versus Connor from 1989. Use of force will be used, will be determined by the reasonable officer on the scene. The first one on the scene to choke out Eric was that Pantelano guy. And so he didn't go to prison for murder. He was allowed to choke him out and kill him because there were, he didn't break the law. The cop didn't break the law. I mean, I want you guys to understand that. Ronald Green, if you guys haven't seen Ronald Green's video from Louisiana, I have the video. I'm going to distribute it soon. The Louisiana State Police took it off their website. I got it. I downloaded it before they did. Ronald Green was beaten to death. They beat him to death. I have the video. It's disgusting. They beat him to death. They told his family that he died in a car accident. Then they withheld the body cam footage for two years. We need a third party for the body cam footage. But Ronald Green, where you watch him get beaten down and get murdered ultimately, a couple of those cops broke policy. Most of them were, were working within the law. Most of the cops who killed Ronald Green were working within the law. He was still moving. They told him to lay on his belly and not to move. You can't move. You gotta lay on your belly and play like there's a bear over you. If you move when you're laying on your belly, you must be wanting to fight the police. That must, must be wanting to happen here. Just like Jacob Blake wanted to bring a knife to a gunfight before cops. If you believe that lie is true, ask the blind man, he saw it too. So, so if you don't know about Graham versus Connor, and now we're talking, I was, I was still staying, I, I just got emotional for a second, so I had to come back down to earth here. So we're still talking about the prison system and how it was ultimately created. So we've gone down the list. If you guys have been here for the last hour, I've been here on a marathon day here today, but it's fine. It's my birthday, so I wanna just enjoy this. I wanna teach as much as I can. I kind of dedicated myself, as my birthday was coming in, I was working on a video. Uh, I said, you know what? Just for the next two days while, while it's my birthday, I'm just gonna teach, 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 teach. You know, I have to raise funds all the time. I'm always like, buy my book, buy my shit. But I'm gonna teach you guys as much as I possibly can because I made it around the earth another year. So I'm gonna teach you guys as much as I possibly can. So, so now right here, we're at 89, right? And then in 89, what's gonna happen, we got, we got that Graham versus Connor ruling that's gonna say use of force is gonna be used by the objectively reasonable officer. Then what's gonna happen in a case called Sitz versus Michigan State Police. This is 1990, 1990 1991. I don't know, it's 90 or 91. Sitz versus Michigan State Police, I'm gonna say it's 1990. You're welcome to fact check me on that. But this is what allows DUI checkpoints, this case right here in 1995. 1999, 90, it's 90, it's 90 for sure. Because Lopez versus the United States is 95. So the Sitz versus Michigan State Police, I'm pretty sure it's 1990. What this is, is this allows DUI checkpoints and why does it allow DUI checkpoints? 
because police officers are reasonably suspicious that someone is driving down the road drunk. So your Fourth Amendment right, your Fourth Amendment right to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects. Effects is your car. That's your car. Effects is your car. It's your cell phone. You know what your papers are. You know what your houses are. Sorry about that. Lighting's a little funny, sorry guys, the lights went down. So uh, I, use, I just use these lights, I just, I just use the lights from the windows, I don't really use the lights. Uh, cause that also teaches me that it's time to get off and go like, live a life somewhere. <laughs> so, so, now, so now what does it say here? And, 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 and let's, cross, let's, let's, let's cross reference it with what I just showed you so that you guys can understand. If a cop is reasonably suspicious of you, you have a right to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects. That's your car. You have a right to be free in your car. This is actually, you could put automobile here. You have a right to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and your car. Against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. So what does that mean exactly? What does that mean exactly? That means in Sith versus Michigan State police car, but now the Supreme Court, who their number one job is to make sure that your civil liberties are protected, that you have a right to be secure in your effects or in your car, you have a right to travel freely unmolested as you drive down the road. What they're going to say is that the media, the media has shown us that drunk driving is an astronomically large problem. And we can't deny the media and what they've shown us. And so now here's what the actual holding is. The, the, the actual holding with the Supreme Court personnel, I don't call them justices because they're not. They're appointed elitists who work against us. So you don't call them justices. So what they, the actual holding was that the DUI program has proven to be effective. So we're going to allow it to continue. That's a convergence of rights. That's a convergence of power. That's an actual legal term called a convergence of power. You have to understand what that means. That means that the Supreme Court here in 1990, they held that because a DUI program is effective and because some people are dying, that you don't have a right to drive down the road free. They also held in the opinion that it's a minor inconvenience for you to pull over for a DUI checkpoint. Well, just so you know, the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals said no, they struck down the law. They said, no, you can't put up a checkpoint in the middle of the road and ask Americans to blow in a straw and start questioning them. That's totally unfucking constitutional Every bit of that is unconstitutional. Not a single bit of that is un none of that is constitutional. You do not have to pull over and answer questions to a cop as you drive down the road. That is not what that says. That is not say that. It is not reasonable. The Supreme Court, the way they fuck us is they use this term here. They say, is it reasonable or unreasonable? That's the Supreme Court's constant ruling. Is it reasonable or is it? And so they say it's a reasonableness standard. And so they say it's a reasonable thing for you to be willing to pull over and answer questions to the police, even though you have a Fifth Amendment right not to answer questions. How does that, how does, that's how you know. The DUI checkpoint includes where you get pulled over and asked questions by law enforcement. We have a Fifth Amendment right to not answer questions to law enforcement. That's how you know we've lost our way. That's how you know these guys are absolute dog shit. That's how you know they're dog shit. We have to break them up. Let me just, let me just tell the fact, all right? We have to break them up into six different districts and we have to elect them by the people. We didn't elect senators until the 17th Amendment in 1913. We did not, the people you vote for today, your senator in your state, you didn't vote for him before 1913. So why, why'd we vote for senators in 1913? Because it was going like shit. Because it was going like shit. See that lynching chart? The senators weren't helping. It was going terrible. It was going awful. It was going like hell in a handbasket. So the 17th Amendment is passed in 1913 that elects senators. Why did that happen? You don't gotta be a genius. 
We didn't elect senators for 150 years, from 1776 until 1913. That's almost exactly 150 years. 140, whatever. I'm not good at, who cares? Why did we elect senators with the 17th Amendment? Why? How come? If it doesn't matter, why elect them by the people? If they're not abusing power and ruining our country, then why do we elect senators with the 17th Amendment in 1913? We haven't elected senators for 150 years. Why does it happen here? Because things are going like shit. How are things going here? Conservative? Republican? Liberal? Democrat? How are things going? You happy? Are things going swell? When you drive down the road tonight, who are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? You afraid of me? You're not afraid of me. You afraid of anybody else? You afraid of another man? You're not afraid of another man. You look at me and you're like, I could whip his ass. You probably could. That's fine. But you're not afraid of me. If you see me on the street, you're not afraid of me. If I flash my lights at you and I'm road rage, you're like, oh man, you son of a bitch. Fucking pull over, bro. Pull over, right? You're not scared. You're looking at that guy like, this guy's fucking melting down having a road rage, right? But you're not scared of me. You're not, and I'm tough. You're still not scared. You might get a little like, man, this guy's real. I hope he doesn't hit my car, but you're not afraid. You're not like, oh fuck, shit could go bad here, right? Because most of the time road ragers, if you just slow down or turn off, they, they leave you alone. But if you drive down this road tonight and the cops pull up behind you and those red and blue lights go on, who's the third party for checks and balances? Who's gonna make sure that you don't get drug off to a dungeon? Who's gonna do that? Who is it? Nobody. There's no checks and balances on your liberty. And what's the founding principle of America? I'll give you a clue. What's the founding principle of America? What's the number one principle of why America was formed? What's the number one principle of America? What's the number one principle? Someone write that right there. What is that word right there? The number one principle, the number one reason John Locke, Montesquieu, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, what were their principles that, that, that James Madison and Thomas Jefferson copied and created the Bill of Rights? These guys wrote the books and James Madison and Thomas and Jefferson copied them. Everything was based on what? Everything was based on what? Liberty. What do we got now? You drive down the road, you're done. You're done. You think you're good? You think you're good? Everything was going great. You were having a good time. You were going to that concert. Cop pulled in behind you. He didn't like you. How's it going to go for you tonight? How's it going to go? There's no checks and balances. There's no checks and balances. We need a third party organization to get that body cam footage. Do you guys see the new tape today? Let me calm down here. Fucking just pisses me off. This isn't rocket science. I'm not talking algebra here. This isn't like 4x to the parabola squared with quadratic formula and throw in some, some, some graphs and some aerospace geographic XL47T, twist it to pi. This is not complicated. We need a third party or agency for checks and balances on police. This Mullen Commission right here, I'm not gonna get into it because it's just too much, but I got this Mullen Commission, 1994. It says, we need an external third party for police. Did it happen? No. This one article right here, this one article right here, right? The Mullen Commission comes out, right? And everybody knows, man, cops are garbage. Like the policing apparatus, the anti-corruption agencies have all failed. Internal affairs has failed. There's no checks and balances. Commanders are not writing up reports fairly. They're writing up reports based on what they want the public perception to be. This is all in the Mullen Commission. I've read it. It's an easy read, right? So I read the Mullen Commission. It says cops are doing terrible. They either the muscle for the drug gangs, there are the drug gangs, or they're the organization for the drug and alcohol gangs. And that's what's in the Mullen Commission in 1994. They're deeply involved in crack, Crips and Bloods, cops all through it. Cops all through the Crips and Bloods. That's what the Mullen Commission says. I didn't write it, okay? So now what happens here in the 1994 crime bill, because the 1994 Mullen Commission comes out and says the cops are so lawless that none of them are good, that the culture has become so corrupted that if you are good, you better shut the up. 
Stand in line or you're not going to advance anywhere. And if you tell on anybody here in the Mullen Commission, it says they'll put a dead rat on your windshield and you won't be able to go to another precinct or job anywhere without you being a rat following you around. So what is the reply by the police department? Benjamin Bratton, we get a monitor. We get a monitor plugged into the New York Police Department. We get a monitor put in there. That's what this article right here is about. Benjamin Bratton fires the monitor. Benjamin Bratton, the guy who created the broken window theory. Arrest anybody for any infraction. So just so you know, Benjamin Bratton's window, broken window theory that you can arrest anybody for any infraction of the law, the Supreme Court will put that into law in the 2001 case of Atwater versus City of Lago Vista. When Gail Atwater is driving down the road in obviously City of Lago Vista, she's with her kids. She's in a real small town, only a few thousand people. She's trucking along real, real slow on the side of the road, just talking to neighbors, really. Cop sees her. He pulled her over last week, and he's going to teach her a lesson this time. He arrests Gail Atwater for not wearing her seatbelt. Now, this is a very small town in Texas, and so when he goes to arrest her with her two kids in the car, the neighbors come running out like, what's going on? And she's screaming, he's going to arrest me because I didn't wear my seatbelt. He says, well, I pulled you over last week, and you wasn't wearing your seatbelt, and I told you to put your kids in a seatbelt. You could have killed them kids, so I'm going to treat you like you did. And so then he arrests her for not wearing a seatbelt. It goes to the Supreme Court. Her husband finds out about it, he's fucking pissed. He goes down to the Sheriff's Department, he files a complaint, freaks out. You arrested my wife in front of her children for not having a seatbelt on. You were gonna give my kids to Child Protective Services. Their cops were trying to give his kids to Child Protective Services. The neighbors came over and took the kids and said, no, 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 we're taking them. He was calling CPS to take Gail Atwater's children. Sound familiar? doesn't it? So they go to the Supreme Court. Your girl, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is on the court at this time, 2001. They go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's like, uh, yeah, we're divided on this. <laughs> what? You're divided on this? It's not. So remember, it, it all, the reason why this is hanging here is because it always relates back to the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects in your car. You have, it's the right of the people to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects. It, it's all about that. That's the whole thing. <laughs> so, so when she's in her effect, which is in her car, she has the right to be secure in her car. In other words, you can't be drug out of your car and taken to a dungeon. So he does that. The neighbors grab the kids when he tries to call Child Protective Services. It goes and there's a process and you get to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says we're divided. <laughs> Who do you think it was? Do you think it was conservatives or liberals? Do you think it was conservative Supreme Court personnel? Or do you think it was liberals? Go ahead. What is, who, who was it? I need you guys to participate. Tell me. Was it conservatives or was it liberal Supreme Court personnel? It was five to four. Was it conservatives that voted you can be arrested for any infraction of the law or was it liberals? Who voted for that? Who voted for it? I know who it was. I can tell you who the judges were. But who voted for that five to four? Who voted that you can be arrested for any infraction of the law and it is not a violation of your Fourth Amendment right? Who wrote that? Was that, was that liberals or conservatives? So in 2001, just so you know, the court's going to be balanced five to four liberals to conservatives. There's gonna be five liberals and four conservatives. And let me be double sure. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I, I have that backwards. It was five conservatives and four liberals on the court at that time. Um, Kennedy though, Kennedy was back and forth. He was both a liberal and a conservative, um, as well as Sandra Day O'Connor who was a disgusting human being that would be better off if she had never been born. But she was the first woman on the Supreme Court. But celebrate her, because she's a woman. You don't know what she did, but you know, celebrate her. That makes sense. She's a woman! <laughs> so it was uh, four conservatives, and they got one swing liberal named David Souter. And of course, when you have four conservatives and one liberal, they always want the, the one minority in the group. So if it's three conservatives and two liberals, they want one of the liberals to write it. If it's you know, four, conser four liberals and one conservative, they're gonna want the, the conservative to write the opinion that kind of encompasses all their position. So five to four, four conservatives, and then David Souter 
piece of garbage. He's the one that writes the opinion, and, and I know the words, obviously. He says, he says that if you break the law, that's probable cause. If you break the law in front of a law enforcement in any way, shape, or form, that you can be taken to jail and it is not a violation of your Fourth Amendment right. So essentially, Atwater versus City of Lago Vista, you don't have a right to be secure in your car. Your effect is your car. You don't have a right to be secure in your papers, in your houses, or in your person if there's any infraction of the law. So imagine you're in your house and you flip off the neighbor. You guys are having a fight back and forth. And the cops get there and you put your fingers on and say, you copper, get out of here, copper, right? And you're screaming back towards the neighbor. Well, you're disturbing the peace. So you don't have a right to be secure in your house. They can break your door down, come in there and grab you. As soon as we allow police to take you to the dungeon for anything, then anything goes. So, I'm sorry, his picture is so small. He was, he was one of the first ones. He was the beginning of my wall. So forgive me for his picture being so small. I didn't go back and correct anything here. I just let it ride. Um, maybe you guys heard of a guy named George Floyd? You guys ever heard of that guy? Anybody? Has anybody here heard of George Floyd? Has anybody heard of George Floyd? Has anybody heard of George Floyd? Anybody heard of him? Has anybody heard of George Floyd? You heard of him, right? So George Floyd was arrested for passing a funny $20 bill. Do you need to take someone off the street and take them to a dungeon for passing a funny 20 if he did it? Or do you need to get the 20 and get his fingerprints and investigate? Because if he did it or not, do you need to take him to a dungeon? Did George Floyd need to go to a dungeon? Apparently he'd just taken a hit of some drugs and he was having a pretty good time. Kind of probably lying fluffy, probably feeling good, right? Because he's on drugs. And, uh, and, and then he's in the checkout. Maybe he passes a funny 20. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Let's say he does. Let's just give the benefit of the doubt. He does. And then he's leaving and the cop's like, hey, you passed this 20 in front of our bell. And so now, but does he need to go to a dungeon? Does he need to go to a dungeon? Probably not. Probably not. He passed a funny $20 bill. He's not like on top of someone with his forearm. He's not like, you know, threatening to fight someone. He's not pulling a boxing stance. He just, he passed, he, allegedly, he passed a funny $20 bill. Atwater versus City of Lago Vista says a cop can arrest you for any infraction of the law. And that cop knew George, and so he was going to arrest him. You gave one man absolute power over another man. What do you think is going to happen when you say this is a protected citizen? This is a protected class. You can't defend yourself against them and they can do anything they want to you. What do you think is going to happen? How many times did the cops beat me up? You think they could beat me up if, they, if, I, didn't, if I fought back? I don't. DeleteLaws.com. Go by my website. If you learned anything at all from me today, please go by my website. Pick up my ebook. Pick up my uh, wall graphic. Get an exact replica of this wall graphic. This is my big pitch here. I got to get out of here pretty quick. So go by my website. Pick up my wall graphic right there. Pick up my ebook. It's on DeleteLaws.com. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm super grateful. I'm super grateful. Thank you so much. DeleteLaws.com. If you don't have the 20 bucks, just sign up anyway and I'll send it to you for free. If you want to buy me a cup of coffee, that's my Venmo, my cash app. Take a screenshot. I don't want to be here all day. Take a, take a screenshot, Venmo, cash app. Buy me a cup of coffee. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Super grateful. Super, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the support. Delete Laws is also my YouTube page. Please go by the YouTube page. Go by that YouTube page, Delete Laws. It's two words. Delete and laws. Delete and laws. L-A-W-Z. Please go by my YouTube page. Please go by the YouTube page. So, you know, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is? Are we, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is? Are we, are we still alive? I'm still alive. I guess I'm still going. Thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for all the likes. I really appreciate it. I hate to leave a couple hundred people hanging. I may come back and get back on after I go to the gym, but tomorrow is my birthday in the morning, so I want to wake up and I want to feel good. I want to feel like I got all the water out of my face and I want to feel like I'm... I'm doing the best things I can to take care of myself. You know, if it wasn't my birthday with 250 people on, I probably would stay and keep teaching, but it's my birthday tomorrow. I want to feel good. 
I want to feel good. You know, I want to feel healthy and strong. And I'm going to get up tomorrow at 6 a.m. I'll be, I'll be on tomorrow early. I'll be on tomorrow early. Saturdays and Sundays are my big fundraiser days. So I'll be on tomorrow early. I'll be on tomorrow super duper early. I'm super grateful. Thank you guys so much. If you guys will do me a favor, I got to go. But if you go to my last video and everybody drop a comment, like that last video, watch it through. Let's try to infect as many people with these ideas. Let's try to get as many people infected as we can. If you guys have been waiting on a six foot wall graphic uh, and also people who bought graphics from me, I got that final one coming in this weekend. Oh man, it is dope. I just, I just used the courthouse and I, I, I added in a cool background and I just changed a few things that uh, are really, really cool, that are really cool. They're really cool. I'm really excited to share with you guys. Anyway, I don't want to sit here and grandstand all day. I already took you guys enough of your time. So thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys tomorrow morning. I'll be here tomorrow morning, all right? Thanks again. Love you guys. Later.